Hi there, and a very warm welcome to this week's gacha video. So this is the third video in a row where I go about gachas, and I really have to thank Chios for his idea because the response was really overwhelming. If you in the future have any ideas for more gacha videos, please let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, I hope this video contains gachas you don't know, because this is the rendering gacha video. So let's strap in and get going. Welcome to 3D Land with our trusted material ball here. So before we actually dive into rendering gotchas, let's recap our material gotchas, because I've been asked in the comments if there's any way to store presets so you don't have to set up the material every time you bring them in. What I'm talking about is if you go to materials and for example create a octane glossy material, it comes in with slightly unrealistic values. For example, the BRDF model here is best set to GGX energy preserving, the diffuse is slightly hot and is better set to 0.7 to 0.8 if you want to go for white values. And last but not least, the index is slightly underperforming and needs to be set to 1.5 to gain the right reflection. Now, if you don't want to do that every time you create a new material, and actually it's a different procedure for different materials, you have to invest in presets. And actually in Cinema 4D, this is a very easy thing to do, at least in new versions. So you can head up here and click Save Preset. Now let's call it Glossy. And also what you can do is save it as a default. Here we go. Now this little ground here indicates that is your master preset and it should pop up every time you create a material. Unfortunately, Octane doesn't respect that. To show you, if we go up to materials and create another glossy material, you can see we are back to our old defaults and this is not what we set up. Now this is as easy as a two-click solution, so one, two. Now we have the preset applied to your new material but this might be still something you forget. So there's an even better way. And this comes in the form of the new asset browser. So I have created a new category under materials by right clicking create category and this is called Octane Materials. Now what you can do here if you've preset your material, name it correctly and then just drag it in here. Now this is even more than just a library, because the new asset browser also allows you to put those new presets into the UI. So what you can do is just drag them in here and have them set in the UI and then collect them from here. So let's show you by creating another glossy and you can see the new glossy, despite also its name, has the right settings applied. So it's GGX, the diffuse is okay, and the index is 1.5. So here you go. This is what you need to do for all your Octane materials, and then you don't have to worry again. Welcome to our actual first rendering gacha. Now this is actually two in one, so this is our first two. And if I direct your attention to the material ball, you notice that there is a big black border underneath it. And more experienced users might suspect the Ray Epsilon and this is absolutely right. So this is our first gotcha, get the Ray Epsilon right. I also made a video that's going a bit more in depth into that topic. If you want to watch it, click on the upper right corner now. The next gotcha that has to do with that is that later in the project, I might want to switch my kernels. So instead of direct lighting, I want to use path tracing. Now my attention might be somewhere else, so I don't notice that the big black border here came back. And this is the second gotcha, the values between render kernels are not connected. So if you set up a new rendering kernel, make sure all the important values are carried over from the old kernel to the new one. The next one is pretty much on the line of the render kernel not taking over the values of other kernels. So let's say we have this rendering here and we dialed in the values and we are satisfied and want to final render. So we render into the picture viewer and get something totally different out of there and wonder why that is. Now the solution is very simple. 
So basically, inside of the Octane render settings, the override kernel settings is enabled. And of course, I made the result more drastic than it could be. It could also be just a ray epsilon value that is incorrect. So the gotcha here is to make sure that your overwritten values are correct and what you want. So let's say you want to change them to the values in your live viewer and don't want to type them in one by one. Obviously you can turn them off, but sometimes it's nice to have a different sample count for the live viewer than for your final rendering. So what you could do is just go to settings and copy to video post. And this will actually copy the settings from your live viewer to your override samples in the current render settings you're in. So make sure your render settings that you want to copy them in is active. So now we have the exact same settings as the live viewer and we can, for example, increase the samples here so we have a more clean final rendering. Now, this topic could have been in last week's scene gotchas, but somehow it moved into the rendering gotchas and it has something to do with instances and motion blur. Octane surely has its quirks with those. I'm sure this is harder to explain than to understand, so what we have here is a null object that is animated and inside of the null object we have a cube and two instances where the cube is instanced to as a render instance. Now if we move that, you can see that those instances get some unrealistic motion blur. And this has something to do with the fact that the cube is moving with them while they're instanced. There again are multiple solutions. One of them is just to set that to instance and when we move through the animation then the motion blur is correct. But if you have more poly heavy objects of course the scene is then less efficient as it could be. So the other way to do that is again if we go to the cube and replace it with a instance. So let's do this by going to here, instance, and move the instance inside and the cube outside of the moving group and render instance, and then try that again. You can see now the instances have the right motion blur. And don't even think about hiding the cube inside of a null because that won't work. So what we need to do again is just moving it out of sight. And this is what you set up if you have moving instances with motion blur. By the way, I also have a more in-depth video about this upper right corner if you like. The next two are of the same topic and this is alpha channels. Now the first one of those two is barely worth mentioning, but since I run into that more often than I would admit, this is an important one. Please, if you want to use alpha, tick on the alpha channel. I rendered whole animations only to notice at the end that the alpha channel wasn't ticked on and it was missing in my renders. So as simple as this is, it can happen. Also, another gotcha connected to it. When you render with alpha and save it through the octane output, so here, you have no problems with that. But if you save through Cinema 4D, also make sure you have this alpha enabled, otherwise you know what will happen. As promised, this is the second part of the alpha topic and yes, it has a reason why the foreground element is blurred and the background element is bright red. And this has something to do with the handling of partially transparent alphas in our scene. So when dealing with alpha situations over the years in compositing, I noticed that the best way to get the most of your renders is to render in straight alpha. And I know this is a very big topic and it probably deserves its own tutorial. So I'm going to gloss over here a little bit and get the most important points down. Okay, as per our former gotcha, we obviously have to enable the alpha channel. And you can immediately see why I opted for a red background, because now at the defocused area between the object and the background, the background is bleeding through. To best mitigate that is to disable the rendering of the background altogether, so disable environment. And now you can see we have a perfect transition. If you don't have that in your rendering, you might want to check the pre multiplied alpha section, because it can be stuck on some other mode and this would give you a black edge instead of a red one. So make sure the pre-multiplied alpha is set to none. 
Let me actually render that so you can see a counter or a negative gotcha. So if you render, you might be surprised that your object now has a checkered edge, but this is perfectly fine and normal for a straight alpha. Let me explain. So Octane extends the beauty to its outer edge, so the alpha here can chip away that edge without bleeding into the black background. So the only thing the alpha gets is just the color of the beauty. Now there's a word of warning here, and this is if you set your Cinema 4D save also to have a straight alpha, and let me render again, then you end up with a double straight alpha, which then is producing a white edge instead of a normal edge that fades off naturally. Now you can see that Cinema 4D also added its straight alpha on top of the straight alpha of Octane, and this is not a good thing. Let me demonstrate that to you in Fusion. Okay, welcome to Fusion for a short while, so let's bring in our Octane rendering here and display it, and you can see there's this nasty edge here. And this has something to do with the way Fusion interprets this footage, so let's click on the footage, import, and then go post multiply by alpha, and now it's looking correct. So next let's bring in the Cinema 4D file with the double straight alpha here and display it. This is having a much more pronounced edge and even if I go and post multiply alpha, the edge is not going away. And this is what double straight alpha is doing to your footage. It's not good at all. Back to Cinema 4D and the next rendering gotcha. A rather small one, but nonetheless very important and I also managed to forget that one too. So what I'm talking about is in the Octane output settings, and actually those output settings are recommended because they are connected to the core directly, is the save beauty button here. Because if you don't tick it, the beauty is not safe with your main render, despite being shown in the render output. So it can be really misleading, you think you have set it all and everything looks correct, but when you then later on open your render in comp, the beauty is missing, and no one wants that. And another one of those small ones that can throw you off, so if you have set ACES tone mapping in the image viewer and you're looking through that, and then go to your Octane settings and set this for example to ACES CG and render, then the result in the picture viewer is totally different from what you see in your live viewer. And this is actually no fault, because this is the native ACES without any tone mapping applied, and this is the ACES with the ACES to sRGB tone mapping applied. So the picture viewer doesn't know it's displaying ACES right now, and this is why it's looking different. In an EXR workflow, if you're continuing on in the comp stage, then go for ACES to sRGB mapping there, then you get back the same look than in your live viewer. It's just a bit weird to see that your render changes appearance in your picture viewer. I have multiple tutorials on the ACES workflow for Fusion as well as After Effects. You can find one of them in the upper right corner. Alright, this is another one of those. It's harder to explain, but easy to understand. So we have render layers here. I made a tutorial about this one too. So what the render layer is doing is cutting out selected objects from the background, giving it an alpha, and then provide a reflection and a shadow from those objects to the background. That provides you with the ability to composite those objects wherever you like, for example over real footage. Now I use Octane's internal compositing tools to composite all back together, and as you might have guessed, I also made a tutorial about this topic. What you can see here is that the effects of the reflection and the shadow are rather grainy despite the object looking just fine. The reason for this is that efficiency this time is getting in our way. So if you look here we have the adaptive sampling setting, and the adaptive sampling is written in a way that as soon as it reaches the min samples, it ignores all the transparent alphas in our scene. Now while this is a good thing usually, we have reflections and shadows, especially in those areas where we have the alpha in our main object. And if we go to the noise pass, you can see as soon as we reach 64 samples, this is getting green all over. That means it's not sampled any longer. 
And this means that the shadow and the reflection is not getting more than 64 samples. Now, there are two options to mitigate that. One is to just ignore the adaptive sampling and render everything to full samples, which is giving us a much nicer shadow and reflection. Or what you also can do is give the min samples a high enough value so the shadow is more grain free. And then the rest of the samples can be used to clean up the main objects again. Please, Otoy, if you're watching this, give us an option to ignore the alpha in the adaptive sampling. Thank you. Next, you're going to notice a little bit of a layout change, and this is because I decided to bring in MSI Afterburner with a VRAM indicator. So this is just one card, but this is enough to show you what it's all about. So if I render that in the live viewer, you can see now the VRAM jumps up to 3.8 GB, and this is totally fine and can be rendered on multiple cards, even older ones. Now let's say we are fine with that and want to final render that and then go and render that in the picture viewer. First of all, what you're going to notice is that it takes a whole lot longer to start rendering than we did in the live viewer. And then when it finally renders, you can see that the VRAM usage is a lot more. So almost nine gigabytes now. And this is more than double what we used before. Why is that? Basically, this is a thing that I see a lot of people run into, and this has something to do with the SDS object. So let's double click on the SDS object here and open all of the SDS object settings. And you can see I obviously exaggerated that a little bit, but our render subdivisions is at six, while our viewport subdivisions is at one. And it's really important to know that the viewport subdivision also goes for the live viewer. So I would suggest to at least set those both values always to the same amount. So let's set both to two. Let's render in the live viewer again and see the RAM usage. It barely even changed from the old one. So it's 3.8 gigabytes. And let's render in the viewport here and let's see what this is doing. And we can see that although it needs a little bit more VRAM because the picture is HD in terms of size, it's a bit bigger, that the difference is pretty stark in what it was using before. So basically be careful if you have different settings for rendering and live viewer and the best way to deal with them is to put in the same value into both. As all good things have to come to an end, this is already our last gacha. Oh no. I know that this rendering topic probably has the most gachas of all of 3D. Well, maybe simulation artists might disagree. Also, maybe character riggers. I don't know. But I don't want to make this video too long. And if you like it, there's always a chance for another gacha video. As you can see on the graph here, this is again about VRAM usage. And actually, it's more like a tip than a gacha. So if you have a scene that is using tons of VRAM, you can sort of control how much VRAM is used in your cards by the parallel samples value here. So raising that will increase your render speed, but also take more video RAM, and decreasing that will take less video RAM, but also slows down your rendering. So that means that if you have a scene that you struggle to keep in memory and it barely fits, you can lower the parallel samples a little bit to make it fit. And on the other way around, if you have smaller scenes and don't need to worry about VRAM usage, then increase it to the maximum value to get the best speed out of your rendering. But wait, it's not actually over yet. There are some honorable mentions here. So one of them is a new settings inside of the materials, referring to the material gachas in the first chapter. So let me create a metal material here and then go to the IOR section and actually set it to RGB IOR. And you can see now there are presets for different metals. So for example, I can apply gold or brass or copper and get the actual measured values of those metals inside of here. So this is a plus and I just wanted to mention that this is now inside of Octane. 
Last but not least, and maybe a little bit of a sad one. So I noticed that my workflow inside of Octane 2022.1 is currently broken in that the DWAB compression is not working as intended. To show you, I enabled the save option inside of Octane as well as in Cinema 4D and on both locations I'm saving a DWAB compressed EXR. So let me show you what comes out of that by rendering. Now if I bring in the saved files, you can clearly see that the Cinema 4D DWAB compression works as intended. The file size is remarkably small as I advertised in former tutorials and the Octane DWAB compression is in contrast very large, in fact too large. So you don't want to have a 10 megabyte frame when you can have a one megabyte frame. So this is why my hard drives are also filling up more rapidly than I want to. And I really hope Otoy can hotfix that as soon as possible. Otherwise I run out of disk space. But jokes aside, I just wanted you to know that the current DWAB compression inside of Octane is a whopping 10 times as large as it used to be. So be cautious of that. And this concludes this week's video. Thank you very much for watching. I hope there was something in there for you that you didn't know before. I really want to thank my Patreons that are also steadily growing, especially last week. So I take that as a compliment and a good prediction that I'm doing something right. So those gotcha videos really have made an impact. Thank you Chiels again for your idea. Thank you for my 50 euro subscriber again, Shields Augustinen and Leon Studio TV. Thank you so much for your enormous pledge. Also, a huge thanks for my 15 euro subscribers. And there are some new ones in there. First one is at Domestic God in the House to George Luna, Chris Clemson, Laon, Lucas Pazon. Marty Kane, part one of two, Raiko, Render King, aka Alessandro Bonchio, Scene CGI, Shamus Johnson, and Yasin Rupp. And thanks to all of my Patreons and their collective support to make this channel and my output possible. Next week, there's probably going to be a smaller video again. So I'm thinking about doing my five favorite notes, for example. If you have any other ideas or suggestions, please let me know in the comments down below. Now, if you're still watching, thank you very much for sticking with me that long. Let's make a game out of this, actually. If you're still listening to me right now, let's post a nerd emoticon in your comment. Thank you very much. Other than that, I say until next time and happy rendering. Bye.